Hey, welcome to another week of the Gathering Church Podcast. I'm so glad that you are choosing to listen or watch this week's message. Uh, we're going to talk about grace. Uh, does grace only covers your sin or does grace empowers you to live above sin? I encourage you to grab a notepad, open up your Bible and dive deep into the last few verses of the book of Romans uh, with us uh, in the first chapter. Uh, a few updates uh, about things happening here at the gathering. Last weekend, we had our Bub Up food distribution in Odessa. Great success, lots of help, lots of youth coming uh, to help. And listen, we're reaching that community. We're still working in the remodeling process of our Odessa campus. Uh, hopefully, this year we'll be able to open back up. Uh, in the meantime, you can always continue to support in prayer, in giving towards the building fund in Odessa. Uh, I know that God is on time, never early, never late. So we're just allowing Him to do as He pleases. But in the meantime, we're continuing to distribute food every other month. Third Saturday of each month, we distribute food in Odessa. And the next month, which will be February, we'll be distributing food here at our Midland campus. If you want to be part of that, make sure you check our Facebook and um, our church app and our events and get plugged in. Hey, life groups are going on already. Life groups are happening. Young adults, women, uh, working women, adults on Wednesday nights here when youth happens at the gathering, get plugged in. Everything is in our church app. And um, one more thing, our Lent devotional. You can still order a Lent devotional. This is uh, devotional Pastor Larry Long, our teaching pastor, wrote on the last seven words of Jesus. And we're going to start uh, diving into this devotional for 40 days at the end of February when Lent begins. Uh, so I encourage you to be part of that. And on top of that, we created a chat group within our church app. If you open up our church app on the top right corner, you'll see some little icons like a chat icon there. You click on it and it's going to take you to several groups that we have in the church where we have discussion groups. One called My Gathering, which is general information and general prayer requests for the church. I encourage you to jump in and get plugged in and then in the chat room, find a Lent group. This is for those of you that are going to go through the devotional. We'll have discussions there. We'll have prayer requests there. And we're going to go through this 40 days uh, journey towards Easter together in that chat group. Hey, once again, super grateful for your continued support in giving, in generosity, and in praying and serving. If you are trying to find a place to plug in and serve, make sure you find that form in our church app and you join our team. Super grateful for all of you. God is definitely moving in our midst. I hope you enjoyed today's message and I hope you come Sunday prepared for what is next in this series on the gospel, the good news uh, based in the book of Romans. Uh, praying for you, uh, get plugged in, enjoy the message. Amen, amen, amen. You may be, you may be seated. It's really, really good to be in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Um, if you have not been following along this sermon series, I encourage you to do so. It's a challenging series. It uh, could potentially be a long series. I think Pastor Larry shared with me uh, last week, he said, like, one time I tried to preach through the book of Romans, it took us like over a year or so. Um, and so we're going to follow the, the leading of the Spirit in this, Okay. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Last week we left it, uh, the, the verse before this. Um, it reads like this. It says, therefore. Now, interestingly enough, I already have to stop. Remember last week there was a series of connections. The verse kind of like explained the previous verse. And then the following verse explained the previous verse. And it was just a chain reaction of explanations, right? And so... This verse begins with therefore. So in order for you to get what therefore he's meaning, he's, you have to either read, listen to the previous verses and previous sermons. Therefore, God gave them over in, their sin, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. For the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. 
Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sex relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become with They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they knew Or they know God's righteousness decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. It is by grace through faith that we can be saved. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2.8 reminds us, for it is by grace through faith you have been saved. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Grace, right? I want to talk to you about living under God's grace today. When you think about grace, you think about mercy and not getting what you deserve. When you think about grace, you think about salvation. When you think about grace, you probably often think about the reality that we're sinners in need of forgiveness. And I guess one of the biggest questions for those who follow Jesus is, are we saints or sinners, right? (laughs) Well, we don't have to be, as Paul has been telling us in the previous verses, under the lordship of any creation, but rather under the lordship of the creator. Sin begins with idolatry. In fact, the root of human relentlessness, of human sin, the root of it is the substitution of something other than God, the creator and father of Jesus Christ as Lord. If anything takes the place of God in your life, that becomes your idol. And that is, a, that is a created thing and not the creator himself. And that will lead ultimately to sin. Now what's shocking about this passage is that Paul describes God's punishment for the sin of idolatry. What we just read is the description of the punishment for the sin of idolatry. Now, the description contains a list of actions on sinful desires. It's not just what I think I should do. It's acting on what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. Sexual impurity, we're told. Degrading of their bodies and more. The list is filled with a description of what sin looks like. God gave them, it says. Over in the sinful desires of their hearts. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. But Paul tells us, and this is what's shocking, that these things, these sins described in these verses are signs of wrath. Now hear me out. We can easily mistake these Actions, these sinful behaviors as signs of God's grace, right? Let me tell you why. Because we often look at that and we think, well, they are not getting what they deserve. They're living in sin, yet they're still alive. Even though they are living in sin, they're not getting what they deserve. So this must be grace. But God's wrath, according to Paul, is revealed here, not in the form of fire or in some sort of judgment or punishment. No, the wrath of God in this text consists in God letting humanity have its own way. So what is the punishment of sin? Well, may I suggest to you that at least for now, the punishment of sin is simply sin. 
God, according to Paul, is punishing sin by letting us have control over our own destiny. If you've ever had an argument with your spouse, the last words you want to hear is, fine then, do what you want. (laughs) You know it's not good. You know it doesn't mean do whatever you want. Now, sure, there, there will be a day when sin will ultimately be dealt with, punished with divine judgment. But as of now, God's wrath, according to Paul, gives us freedom to do whatever we want and go with the flow of our desires, allowing those desires to do as we please. Now, don't be mistaken. This permissiveness doesn't end well. Sin ultimately brings punishment. God in his wrath delivers us to the just punishment of sin by becoming permissive. God is the creator. Idolatry is worshiping the created instead of the creator. And God will let humanity carry out the results of its idolatry. Paul's description of what happens Next is not too far from what we see in our world today, is it? Freedom. Freedom for us to do what we want is the punishment for our own rebellion. This freedom is often celebrated, isn't it? It's celebrated as a sign of progress, as a sign of Evolvement, like we're advancing, we're modern thinking, and, and, and this celebration of this freedom is not a sign of progress or a sign of true freedom. Because when we celebrate that we no longer have to obey God's law, we're instead celebrating the visitation of God's wrath upon humanity. Idolatry leads to sin. It may not begin like sin, but if anything takes the place of God in your life, it will lead to sin. It will become destructive. It will break things in you and around you. The reality is that we have abused the created world through idolatry. Every good parent has experienced at some point something similar. You know that time when your kids appreciate more what you give them or buy for them instead of your very presence? (laughs) Well, now it has happened, isn't it? This substitution of the creator for the created will lead to sin. That will lead to sin not only in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual world, but also in the physical world. It's not only about the created. The abuse of the created order also will affect our lives and our society. There is an order that God has established. Male and female, God created them. And the consequences of the sin of abusing or distorting God's divine order will make itself evident when God's Lordship is denied in the spiritual and the physical. Perversion will arise. We have a responsibility in this world. In the way we live as individuals, but also in relation to others. There is a divine design and there is a divine order. God is the one who ordered the created world. And any abuse of that created world is an insult to the one who ordered it. And Paul makes it clear that it will not go unpunished. You see, trying to change God's divine design, that created order in terms of human sexuality is a violation of God's created order. And this violation has its roots in idolatry. (laughs) Its roots in some selfish ambition, some desire. It's what I feel. I live by feelings, not by what God says. It's what I feel. And we have come To sometimes embrace our feelings, right? More than God's truth. Women exchange their natural relations for unnatural. Men committing shameless acts with men cannot be understood as an alternate 
lifestyle somehow acceptable to God. It may not be celebrated as another expression of God's grace. It's not God's grace. It's clearly portrayed here as a sign of God's wrath. When the created order is abused in idolatry, in denying the lordship of God, the consequences in which humanity is delivered are the consequences of wrath. You see, the exchange of the truth about God for a lie, which brings with it the dishonoring of bodies, will also bring with it the disordering of society. It will not only affect you, it will affect those around you, and it will affect society. Now, please don't be too quick to condemn sexual immorality, which abounds in our world today. (laughs) But let's not be too quick to condemn that only without checking our own hearts. Because Paul gives us, after this, uh, an illustrative list of other consequences of sin. He says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, landers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. The point of the passage is not to find reasons to feel superior in the condemnation of others. It's not to make you feel better if you don't do any of these. The, 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 the point is to repent of sin and to pray desperately for forgiveness for ourselves and for our society. Our world is broken. Although they knew God's righteousness and his decree of righteousness. That those who do such things deserve death. It says they not only continue to do these very things. But they also approve of those who practice them. Paul in these last verses condemning the desire to make private sin the measure of public conduct. And that's when we have confused grace. Where is grace in all of this? Well, let's be honest about one thing. We all have used grace to justify or at least to feel better about our sin. We all have said things, well, I'm just a sinner. <laughs> or we try to bring some type of consolation to those we know are hurting and saying, don't feel too bad. It's, it's not, I mean, it's okay. God, God, God still loves you. And, and that's okay. But at some point we have to say enough. <laughs> Where is the grace? The reality is that we're all rebellious people. Glorying in the freedom we often call grace. Now finding out that Paul calls it the punishment of sin and a manifestation of wrath. Listen, the last thing you want God to do with your life is to tell you, fine, then do whatever you want. Have at it. But if there is a hint, if there is a little something within you that tells you this is not right, this is not right, that's God's grace calling you to repent. You see, the permissiveness celebrated as modern way of thinking. That permissiveness celebrated us evolving that permissiveness celebrated (laughs) we're finding out according to paul is nothing more than the permission to fall deeper into sin fine then do what you want so where is the grace in all of this i said it this morning don't worry the sermons will get better after this one i hope (laughs) where is the grace Grace is found in God's divine discipline. In his law, in his word. His word is the manifestation of his gracious order. In his word we find out how, when, who, and what steps to take in this world. We find out how to deal with conflict, how to deal with trouble. We find out that in this world, even though we will have trouble, we can trust Him because He already overcame the world. That's God's grace in His discipline. Yes. 
This is the manifestation of His gracious order. You don't want God to tell you, okay, just do whatever you want. And you see, we live in a world and a society in which discipline is disappearing. We live in a world in which anything is permitted. We have failed. Yesterday we went and gave away food and the, the, the room was full with teenagers and I saw hope. And I thought to myself, if, if they don't fall in love with Jesus and the church, this church is going to die. Because we're all getting older. I mean, more than two of you told me, I can't carry anything today. <laughs> but without the discipline of God's grace in our lives, manifested through good parenting, bold parenting, bold leadership within the church, it will not happen. Because God's grace is not the freedom to live as you please. God's grace is the constraint to live according to His will. Amen. Parents are now afraid. Parents are now afraid of their children. Authorities are afraid of criminals. And the list of humanity's dysfunctions go on and on. And all these are clearly a world suffering under the wrath of God. God's grace... Grace is God's act of exercising His Lordship over His creation in spite of their rebellion. And listen, without His Lordship, we're doomed. You think your freedom to do as you please is freedom? is not true freedom. You will end up bound to sin. God's Lordship, His righteousness... Was and is reestablished in Christ on that cross that is empty because our Savior not only died for our sin, but He resurrected. <laughs> but it must be received. And that is where you find grace. You see, that discipline, that conviction, that conscience, the Holy Spirit. Trying to pull you away from that lifestyle, from that bad habit, from that addiction, from that sinful behavior. That discipline which does not let us do whatever comes into our heads is the very essence of grace. Do you want to live under God's grace? Amen. It's easy. Put yourself under His Lordship. Do you want God... To restore things in your life. Put yourself under His Lordship. Amen. So many times we have contrasted discipline and grace. But I suggest to you that they work together. That maybe if we think about it in the, in, in the sense of. For it is by grace you have been saved. We think about for it is by discipline you have been saved through faith. <laughs> discipline not a discipline. Uh, that, that punishes, but a discipline that guides and strengthens and empowers. Yes. Because our God is a God of order. If He's Lord over your life, you can live under His grace to guide you and empower you to do His will. And if you fail, you can get up and try again. So are you a saint or a sinner? Well, in the light of Scripture, and there are way more passages that we could read through, the appropriate word for those who have been saved by grace is saint, not sinner. The word sinner should be used to speak of those who are lost in sin and separated from God. Are you a follower of Jesus? Yes. Well, we as Christians are the holy ones according to Scripture. We are called to hate sin and walk in holiness. And if we do sin, and it should never be the practice of our lives, of course, we should repent and ask God's forgiveness. We should then recommit ourselves to Him and keep walking in the light. Now, we must be careful of how we describe the spiritual state of a true believer. If you're a believer, 
It's different. Now, if we're not careful with this, we run the risk of speaking heresy. Paul said that if the ministry of Christ lifts us in the state of still being sinners, then Christ is the minister of sin. Galatians 2.17 says, If in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not, Paul says. May it never be so when, listen, when, when, when we tell other people, hey, I'm, I'm not a sinner. You may be accused of claiming to be perfect and to have a sinless perfection. How, how will you respond if that's the case? Well, the Bible emphasizes that Christians emphasizes that Christians have been born again, right? Scripture says that if you are born again, you have a new nature. That, that It says that we're no longer slaves to sin. We even used to sing it. I'm no longer a slave to sin, right? We, we sing it. We, we say it. But then the struggle becomes real. Let me tell you that Scripture is not naive. I have Kleenex, please. Thank you. Scripture is not naive. About the fact that believers can, and sometimes, do commit sin. In fact, it's possible, shocker, for genuine Christians, <laughs> through ignorance or the deception of the enemy, to behave in ways that are very sinful and fleshly. Amen. <laughs> but make no mistake. Grace is not permission to sin. Grace is empowerment to live above sin. Grace is if you sin, you realize you sin. You confess, you repent, and hopefully don't commit that sin again. Now the reality is that we all have struggles. And we all may have had struggles for years. And suddenly you are awakened to the reality of your condition. And at some point that grace has to pull you away from the pit that you've decided to live intentionally for years. Listen, sin in the church is a serious issue. This is when discipline comes in, right? Many of Paul's letters contain direct rebukes of the kinds of sins mentioned in our passage today. When individuals persisted in wrongdoing, Paul even called sin within the church in Corinthians. He tells them, you're living in sin. You claim to be saved, but you're living in sin. And Paul called the church and said, we need discipline. He called for church discipline many times. Now that discipline was designed to bring them to repentance and to restore people to fellowship. However, the fact that, saying, that a saint can sin does not mean that we should refer to ourselves as sinners. If you are in Christ, you are not a sinner anymore. You are a saint in God's eyes. <laughs> we are saints who sometimes sin. Not sinners who sometimes obey. Did you hear what I just said? In Christ, we are saints who sometimes sin, not sinners who sometimes obey. If in your vehicle you have that sticker that says, I'm a sinner, take it off. <laughs> if someone reacts to our claim of not being a sinner, may I suggest a response? Living under God's grace. Are you living under God's grace? Yes. Are you living under God's discipline? Yes. Are you allowing God to be involved in your daily routine? Not only in your words, but your actions, even in your thoughts. Gosh, there are some thoughts that we need to work on. 
But it is by grace through faith. I have to believe that He forgives. And because of His sacrifice, I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint in His eyes. And if someone would react to that claim, to this bold claim of saying, I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm a saint in God's eyes. I suggest this response. <laughs> I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ and He has called me to live a holy life. Amen. I'm doing my best with the help of His grace to resist the devil and to walk in the Spirit every day. If I do sin, I ask God to forgive me and I keep pressing forward. I do not and I will not allow my life to be characterized by willful sin. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. In the Son of God. Would you stand up with me? Hallelujah. Faith in that Son of God. Who while I was still a sinner. Loved me. And gave himself. For me. Amen. Father God this morning we praise you. Because while we were still sinners, you saved us. But Lord, if there is sin in our lives, we repent, we turn from it. Lord, we pray that you give us discipline and boldness and courage to stand firm on your word. Lord, I pray for parents in this room who have become afraid to discipline their children. And in doing so, Lord, we have allow the enemy to take a hold of them. Lord, I see a room full of parents who stand in the gap for their children. Who are bold, courageous, filled with your spirit. Lord, I pray for people in this room, Lord, who still have a fight to fight for their homes, for their marriage, for their children, for their family, for those who they love. Lord, I pray for bold men and women in this room, Lord, who will stand in the gap for Midland, Texas and Odessa and this community, Lord, and will say, enough! And Lord, we confess that you are Lord over our lives. Rule over our lives. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Are you living or are you willing to live under God's grace? If that's the case, give him praise as we worship this morning.